Three, two. Good afternoon. My name is Rod McMillian. In the opening remarks, I now call to order the November 14th, 2023 meeting of the Audit Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee, at the discretion and after consultation with staff liaison, may convene an in person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's audit committee is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their name before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. As a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Jamison or Ms. Barr if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Lichter. Ms. Lichter? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Present, sorry. Thank you. Present. Ms. Frempong? Mr. Young? Present. Mr. McMillian? Present. Thank you. A Thank you. A quorum being present, will we begin? Ms. Jamison, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Present. Ms. Manna. Present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. Mr. Strait. Present. Ms. Sample. Here. Ms. Crew. Present. Mr. Edwards. Present. Ms. Smith. Present. Mr. Hartlove. Here. Mr. Fannin. Present. Ms. Howie. Here. Wash. Here. Dr. Wistad. Present. Mr. Kearns. Present. And we have one additional participant from CLA, Ms. Sherry Amos. Are there any <laughs> attendees present, other attendees present that I did not recognize? Hearing no additional names, I turn the meeting back to you, Mr. McMillian. Thank you, Ms. Jamison. Good afternoon. If committee members have questions that are outside the scope of the reports presented this afternoon, please email Ms. Barr or me with your questions. We will follow up with appropriate individuals to get the answers to your questions. Item number three, approval of minutes. The live video footage of our last meeting represents the minutes of the meeting. The meeting stand approved as recorded. Item number four, reports. Ms. Jamison, please proceed with the FY24 Maryland Public Information Act audit report. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Good afternoon, board members, staff and guests. Today, I'm going to present on the audit we just recently completed on the Maryland Public Information Act or PIA. This report is posted on our website and on board docs. The objective of the audit was to determine if BCPS is compliant with applicable PIA laws and policies. Some background about the PIA for those who are not familiar with it. Uh, this act grants the public a broad right of access to records that are in the possession of state and local government agencies. The basic mandate of the PIA is to allow the public to have access to government records without unnecessary costs or delays. Custodians of records have to provide access unless the requested records fall within one of the exceptions in the statute, for example, a student privacy matter that can't be shared. The Office of Law coordinates PIA requests for BCPS. And BCPS has established Rule 2373, which is called Public Information Act Requests, which explains BCPS procedures related to PIA requests. One thing that's important to note is that there are time limits that must be followed when providing responsive records to someone who requests through the PIA process. If a custodian determines that a record is responsive to a request and is open to inspection, the custodian must produce the record immediately, which is per the statute, after receipt of the written request. Uh, an additional reasonable period not to exceed 30 days can be used when additional time is needed. So BCPS uses a 10 business day window to respond initially to requests or to provide information that is available immediately. But if it's not, then they use a 30 calendar day window to provide the records. 
if they are being going to be provided. So that's it for the background. Now for some commendations that came about as a result of the audit. Um, I'd like to thank Ms. Wash, who is the Policy and Compliance Officer. She was my main liaison and contact with the Office of Law and was so helpful during the audit process, very prompt in her responses and getting information to us. So we really appreciate her assistance and Ms. Howie. Another commendation that we came up with was that um, the response time when sending those 10 business day and 30 calendar day letters, the response time improved from FY23 to the first quarter of FY24. For the 10 business day letter, there was an improvement of a 1.7 days faster, which is great. And for the 30 calendar day letter, there was an improvement of 2.4 days faster response. Another commendation is that the Office of Law has a detailed standard operating procedure for tracking PIA requests that aligns with the Annotated Code of Maryland. Another thing we found was that all fees, applicable fees for the PIA requests were properly collected and all 30 day letters, 30 calendar day letters were sent one time. So that's it for the commendations and now on to the findings and there was one minor finding with this audit. Uh, for the 10 business day notification letters, there was nine of 189 in this population, which is 5% that were sent late. Eight were one day late and one was five days late. We developed our recommendation with the intent of helping the Office of Law, if we could, um, trying to figure out a way that might benefit them to improve the response time and also just help them with the I think the overwhelming responsibility of the PIA program um, and what we recommended was that they may want to consider the feasibility of purchasing a PIA management software and this software could have many benefits including automated email reminders that would help with dates and due dates and notifications to ensure that no deadlines are missed, the ability to easily track requests and communications with the requester, and the increased ability to report information about PIA metrics and data. So if someone was to come to us and say, how many requests have you received to date this fiscal year? How many did you respond to? How many were declined? How many were denied? That could all be pulled very easily. Um, and additionally, it, a software system could provide improved coordination across departments. So that's it for our finding and recommendation for the PIA audit. I am going to now turn it over to Ms. Howie to review management's corrective action plan. Thank you, Ms. Jamison. Uh, good evening, members of the committee. I would be remiss if I did not uh, provide and voice commendations. First to the Office of Internal Audit in the person of Ms. Jamison, who was professional, who was meticulous, uh, who had to learn a whole uh, new statute in order to conduct her audit. So I very much appreciate uh, the time that she spent and the way that she went about this review. Uh, I also have to commend Ms. Wash. Uh, Ms. Wash is um, relentless in the way that she makes sure that we as a school system comply with the statute. Uh, she cares uh, very much about the public perception and when she can, she uh, provides answers within a day. Uh, so Ms. Wash does not sit on information and she makes the system look good. So I need to uh, thank her publicly as well as Ms. Jamison because they make my life much easier. Uh, as to management response for um, the findings, uh, staff have already looked into uh, a software package. It's called Just FOIA. Uh, so we will be uh, reviewing it uh, in more depth. We have received an initial quote from the vendor. And again, we'll see whether or not it meets our needs, but it does look as if it will help us um, carry out our, our duties um, in a more streamlined fashion. Uh, with respect to the dates that we missed, uh, as suggested by audit, uh, by the Office of Internal Audit, we have implemented a new calendar system uh, for the dates that we missed so that we're not missing uh, and that if you have to review us again, we'll do, we will not have a 5% error rate in the future. Uh, we do welcome giving uh, an update in the next six months about how we improve our processes. And again, thank you uh, for your review and the way in which you proceeded with this.
Okay, Ms. Jamison, Ms. Howie, thank you very much for your report. Uh, committee members, any discussion on this topic? Hearing no discussion, we're going to move on. Ms. Sample, please proceed with the FY24 Advanced Academics GT Program Eligibility Audit Report. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I am, oh, let's see here. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Let's see here. Okay. So I am Sandy Sample, one of the senior auditors in the office, and we also have Andrea Manna, one of our audit managers who supervised this audit. Also here is Mr. Wade Kearns, who is the coordinator for the Office of Advanced Academics. Mr. Kearns um, can help address any questions you may have regarding gifted and talented eligibility. So we completed the gifted and talented uh, program eligibility audit and issued the final report on November 3rd, 2023. The report can be found on board docs for this meeting and it is posted to internal audits website. Just to give a little background, the Office of Advanced Academics is responsible for implementing advanced academic programs and services in Baltimore County Public Schools. And there are two methods of becoming a GT student, a GT being gifted and talented through the universal screening process and the referral process. At September 5th, 2023, Focus showed that there were a little over 31,000 students identified as GT. And so the objective of the audit was to determine if students identified as receiving GT services have documentation to support their eligibility, and we determined that the screening processes used to determine GT eligibility were applied consistently and equitably. And we reviewed the 2022-23 school year. So with this audit, there were no reportable issues with GET program eligibility. Um, I, there, there was one limitation. Uh, we did have a limitation regarding the referral population. Um, students referred into the GT program. We could not identify the entire population of secondary students who were referred in uh, during the 2022-23 school year. And there's no requirement for secondary schools to retain GT referral information once a placement decision has been made. Um, just because there's a limitation, it doesn't mean that there's a problem with the GT eligibility process. It just means that our office could not identify all the students who were referred into GT last year. Um, if a parent or teacher wants to refer their child into GT, the schools are responsible to review student data and make a decision. And if the student is accepted, schools provide GT instruction. But after that decision is made, schools are not required to keep a running list of which students were referred in the program. Now, when we learned that schools were not required to retain GT referral information, our office decided to conduct a survey to get a better understanding of how secondary schools were handling referrals. Um, there were 55 middle and high schools and 33 of them responded to our survey. And we learned that 20 of the 33 secondary schools that responded actually keep track they keep track of their GT referrals and to, to, to test compliance with the referral process we selected a sample of students from available schools with available information um, so we have a lot of accommodations and good things to discuss about the audit and there are nine to briefly discuss uh, the first accommodation is regarding Mr. Wade Kearns Mr. Kearns was extremely prompt and responsive to all of our audit requests. I would speak to him on the phone and then say, I'll email you the list I need. And before I can email it to him, he sent it over, sent the information over. And we really appreciate that full um, level of cooperation. 
Um, another commendation related to communication was that we found that GT information was available on the website with active links to related content. Uh, we have accommodation related to written processes. As we reviewed written processes, um, we found that they complied with Comar and with Rule 6401. Students identified as GT. We found that BCPS was in compliance with Comar's requirement that at least 10% of BCPS students were identified as GT. We also have a commendation regarding GT determination. For each of the students that we reviewed, we determined that GT determinations were supported with appropriate evidence. We didn't want to see students being randomly added to the program without data to support why they should be there. Um, with regarding GT instruction, our accommodation there, um, students identified as GT instruction through the universal screening process were actually receiving GT instruction at their schools. And we have a referral regarding, I'm sorry, accommodation related to referrals. I mentioned earlier that we conducted a survey of secondary schools. And one of the questions we asked was, what was used to determine if a student should be identified as GT? And we were happy that each of the 33 schools that actually responded to our survey responded with appropriate criteria, including um, they considered student grades, um, assessment scores, teachers' recommendations, which are all appropriate criteria. Uh, we also reviewed the annual report to the board, and that complied with requirements of board policy. And the last commendation um, we have is regarding appeals. If a student is denied entry into the GT program, that decision can be appealed. And for the appeals that we reviewed, we saw that the appeal forms were on file. There was evidence that student data was considered. There was a written analysis and there was um, a evidence that the executive director decision was issued to the family, um, all in compliance with rule 6401. So again, there were no reportable issues with the GT eligibility process. Um, that is the end. I can turn it back to you, Mr. McMillan, McMillian, for any questions. Um, I see you wait. I wasn't sure if you wanted to say anything. No, not at this time. Sorry, I was muted. I apologize. Uh, no, just thank you all for your um, work in this process. Uh, it was uh, a pleasure to go through it with you and I appreciated the feedback very much. Thank you. Mr. McMillian, I'll turn it back to you for questions. Thank you. Ms. Sample and Mr. Kearns, and this goes for to Ms. Wash and also to Ms. Howie. I really appreciate the fact that the BCPS central staff is, is working with the audit department. I've come to realize that that's a critical piece and, and the success of these audits is getting the response back from the staff in a timely manner. So thank you very much for your help and, and making these audits successful. Uh, committee members, any questions related to this topic? I don't see or hear any questions. Therefore, thank you very much, the both of you, for your reports. We're going to move on to item number five, new business. Mr. Hartlove, please proceed with the FY23 Annual Comprehensive Financial Report. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, just a, a, a brief introduction. We have each each year we are uh, uh, it's required that we have our financial statements um, audited by an independent auditor, um, and the firm that we that we use is Clifton Larson Allen. Um, our fiscal year is is July 1st through June 30th. So once the year is uh, completed, uh, actually before the year is completed, but the audit really kicks in once the year is completed and it is it is um, required to be uh, completed um, 
actually September 30th, and then there's a, a single audit that's I believe is required uh, dis by December 31st. Um, so we are bringing uh, the the audit the the uh, the general audit is complete, and uh, I believe everybody has that audit. The point person here internally is Mr. Pat Fannin. He's our controller. He's here today to answer any questions or or um, and then we also have. Uh, Ms. Sherry Amos, who is a principal with uh, Clifton Larson Allen, to um, answer any questions that you have about about the audit. Or I don't know, uh, Ms. Amos, if there's anything you want to 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 uh, say, as well as uh, Mr. Fannin, if there's anything you'd like to say. I, uh, Ms. Amos, you can go first. Sure, sure. Um, I would be glad to give the audit committee a brief overview of the audit this year. Thank you for having me back. Um, as Mr. Hartlow did say, um, we have completed the audit on the annual comprehensive financial report as of June 30, 2023. That audit um, resulted in an unmodified audit opinion, uh, which is a good or a clean opinion. It's consistent um, with the audit opinions that you all have received in previous years. Um, the annual comprehensive financial report is a document prepared by management. It's management's responsibility uh, to prepare the financial information in that document and select the appropriate accounting policies that go along with it. Um, CLA's responsibility is to provide uh, the three or four page audit opinion that goes in to that report, um, which again stated that it was an unmodified or clean audit opinion. Um, one thing I did want to highlight for the committee was we did have a new um, accounting standard that we implemented this year. It was um, accounting statement, standard number 96, subscription-based information technology arrangements. Um, this was a pretty substantial standard compared to maybe some of the other ones we've had in the past uh, where management had to do a thorough review of all the subscription-based technology contracts. Um, that the school system had, which was um, quite extensive. Um, we had noted that our school boards across Maryland uh, enter into a wide variety of IT contracts, subscription-based contracts um, that met the threshold for uh, the standard. Um, and what that resulted in uh, was a added um, right to use subscription asset and liability for the remaining um, years on the contract terms that the school system is liable to pay out into the future. Um, so that's basically the crux of the new standard. Um, as I said, it did result in a lot of work for management to not only compile um, the population of the agreements, but to sift through them, to review them, to see if they met all the individual criteria under the standard. There was a lot of nuances related to that. Um, so, you know, we really are appreciative of all their help um, with the implementation of that standard, um, but that did cause us to have a little bit of a delay in the audit. So uh, we issued roughly mid-October this year um, as we were trying to just make sure that that standard uh, was implemented appropriate for the school system. We did, <clears throat> excuse me, put an emphasis of matter paragraph in our opinion, stating that we implemented the standard, but our um, audit opinion was not um, affected um, per se because of this, the standard. Um, did also want to convey a couple other items for the audit committee. Um, we did have one corrected misstatement um, throughout the audit um, and it ended up being a material weakness in internal control. Uh, this was related to um, the food service fund. Um, students and their families have the option to prepay um, for their um, their food service or lunch meals and breakfast meals um, ahead of time. And that revenue that revenue is recorded as deferred revenue until the point where the student actually has the actual meal or purchase, quote unquote, purchases the meal um, each day. At the end of the year, finance goes through and does a reconciliation of the money that was received and the meals that were used against that money and records an adjusting entry to recognize the revenue. However, um, due to staffing shortages and, and some other things, um, that entry was not made this year. Um, so when the audit team received the information, we recognized that a $1.5 million adjustment had to be made to recognize the revenue appropriately um, in the food service fund. So we just um, recommend going forward that you know, management review their policies and procedures to make sure 
those reconciliations that normally happen happen each year and that adjusting entry at the end of the year is made um, prior to the audits. Um, the other item that we had this year as well uh, was related to just one management letter comment um, related to review of user access um, in the Active Directory and Advantage Financial. Um, we just recommend that each year, at least annually, if not um, more frequent, um, that management is reviewing user access to make sure that terminated employees are removed from the system promptly and that the remaining users that have access um, abilities for the different systems, that that access that they have is appropriate based on their job description. A lot of times um, people's job descriptions change or people fill in uh, for, you know, vacations, leave of absences, things like that, and they get more access than maybe they normally would have, and you end up having incompatible segregation of duties within the system um, as, as, as a potential risk um, if you're not frequently reviewing user access to make sure that, you know, um, everybody, given their roles and responsibilities, has the appropriate access um, on a frequent basis. Um, other than that, um, the audit went pretty smooth. Um, we did have a couple estimates, um, which is consistent with prior years. Um, I am required to make sure you're aware of. Um, the estimates are in the incurred but not reported claims for workers' compensation, as well as the um, estimate for the net pension liability and the other post-employment benefit liability. Um, all three of these are actuarial evaluations that are obtained by management and reviewed um, by the audit team to make sure um, that you have a reputable actuary that's performing the calculations and that the um, assumptions that are used are reasonable compared to um, different jurisdictions of your size and stature, as well as accounting standards as well. So um, all three of those estimates seem to be very consistent with prior years and were reasonable um, from our perspective. Um, other than that, we had no disagreements with management. We really appreciate everybody's help. Um, I do know um, a lot of times you think an audit's just of, you know, accounting and, and finance and the records, um, but there's a lot of different um, uh, departments that we touch throughout the audit, including IT, payroll, procurement, um, to name a few. So we're just very grateful for everybody's assistance um, in providing us information timely um, for the audit. Uh, the last piece is the single audit, which is the audit of your federal expenditures. We're still currently working through that audit. It is due December 31st to MSDE. Um, and just to kind of give you a flavor this year, we are testing Title I. Um, we are testing the Education Stabilization Fund, which is um, your ESSER monies. And we are also testing um, the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, which again is another COVID program. So those are the three areas that we're diving into for the single audit, which is all in compliance with the federal regulations and we'll be issuing our report shortly. Um, with that, that's all I had today. I gladly Thank take you, any Ms. questions. Thank you, Miss Amos. Would would Mr. Fannin like to add anything? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say one thing um, in regards to food service. Um, they got hit with a lot of turnover and long-term illness. They basically had one person down there where there's usually about four. And that one person was brand new and we, you know, helped her through it and she did an amazing job. And we now have a new supervisor down there and he's very good. We're working closely with them to make sure this doesn't happen again. Thank you. And I'd personally like to thank Mr. Hartlove, Ms. Amos, Mr. Fan, and, and all the people who assisted with this audit. Thank you very much. Committee members, any questions for on this topic? Hearing no questions, we're going to move on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item number six is announcements. The next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, January 16th, 2024 at 4.30 p.m. Item number seven, administrative function. I will now entertain a motion to convene an administrative function session to discuss the operations of the committee. So moved, Young. Thank you, Mr. Young. It has been properly, and I need a second. Second, Lichter. Thank you, Ms. Lichter. 
has been properly moved and seconded that we convene an administrative function session to determine these matters. Ms. Jamison, will you please call the roll? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is the approval of administrative function.